Klein, and together with Tom Merrill, I run the Political Theory Institute, the host of this evening's event. Um, we have a, a great schedule this semester. Uh, on Friday, March 1st, Anton Barbake is speaking on a web of our own making about the internet. Um, he's the keynote speaker for the Association of Core Techs annual conference that we are hosting this year at AU. On March 25th, we have Michael Zucker reading, really reading the Gettysburg Address. On April 4th, we have our own colleague, uh, Laura Schwartz, speaking on free speech and loving the questions of academic inquiry. And on April 25th, we have Lorraine Tangle on Aristotle's advice for America. So good uh, schedule. I hope to see all of you here. And uh, just incidentally, on Saturday, March 2nd, for the Association of Core Techs conference, um, there is a conference all day on Saturday of undergraduates from around the country presenting about their research. So if you're interested in that, uh, look on the Lincoln Scholars website and, and it's uh, posted there. Okay, but for today's event, it is great to have so many people here in person. We also have people on Zoom, live on Zoom. For those of you on Zoom, uh, you, if you have a question, please enter it in the chat function and, uh, and we can relay it to the speaker uh, during the Q&A portion of the event. And we are very privileged to have today, Hugh Liebert. Uh, he is a professor of political science director of the West Point Graduate Scholarship Program and co-director of the American Foundation's minor at the U.S. Military Academy in West Point, New York. He's a specialist on the history of political thought. He's also written widely on American politics and foreign policy. Liebert's the author or editor of seven books, including Gibbon's Christianity and Plutarch's Politics, the latter of which won the Delville Winthrop Award for Excellence in Political Science. He's currently working on several essays about Edward Gibbons, the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, and a book manuscript on localism in American politics. His articles and essays have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Texas National Security Review, The Point, Claremont Review of Books, and First Things. He earned his BA from Harvard University and an MA and PhD from the Committee on Social Thought the University of Chicago. And so it's a great pleasure to welcome back to the PTI stage, Hugh Lieber. Thank you, Alan. Uh, thanks everyone for being here tonight. Um, so since we're hosted by the Political Theory Institute and I am a political theorist by trade, I thought I'd offer you a theory. <laughs> and not just any theory, but one that is, I think, unfalsifiable which is the best kind of theory there is. It's very <laughs> safe for me, um, but also uh, hopefully a suggestive and um, maybe even illuminating. Okay. So here's my theory. We are living through a crisis in citizenship. We are also living at a time when the genre of biography has never been less esteemed in academia. Hmm. These two facts are related, and they're related in such a way that if we can renew our collective appreciation of biography, we can help to alleviate the crisis of citizenship. That's my theory. I should say up front that I think that that theory, and really any theory, is worth investigating regardless of whether it helps solve some crisis. Right? Um, as teachers and students, our primary responsibility is to pursue the truth regardless of its effects. Um, but I think you know we shouldn't be indifferent to the settings in which we pursue truth uh, because some favor the pursuit of truth a lot more than others. Also, none of us is exclusively a truth seeker, not even us professors who spend their whole life in the uh, ivory tower, right? We're, we're members of families, of nations, of faiths, and each of those forms of membership, you know, characterizes how we pursue the truth and what we can contribute to other people who are learning. With. So I'm going to try to uh, speak tonight then not only as a theorist, but as a truth seeking patriot. Someone who cares about the truth first and foremost, but is also concerned for the fate of our republic. And someone who has the sense, probably self-aggrandizing and mistaken, that my own academic preoccupations have some potential to be of public service. So the title for the talk tonight is Plutarch's Education for Citizenship. Um, and that kind of tips my hand about my academic interests. 
Um, I'm proud to be one of the few, happy few surviving partisans of Plutarch. And I'd be delighted if about 40 uh, minutes from now, you were willing to join me, um, <laughs> join our band of brothers and sisters, uh, Rebecca Burgess, a fellow Plutarchist or something like this. Um, so it's great if you guys want to, want to join me. But the reason I want to talk about Plutarch actually isn't just my peculiar personal fascination with this author from the first and second centuries, it's all but forgotten. Um, the main reason I'm going to talk about him is my conviction that there's no one better than Plutarch to teach us about the relationship between citizenship, biography, and the pursuit of truth. So I'm going to begin by saying a bit more about the uh, premises of my theory, like what citizenship is and what I'm talking about when I talk about biography. Um, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll talk about why biography I think is out of fashion in academia too. Then it's going to be Plutarch time. I'll try to persuade you that Plutarch shows us how citizenship and biography are related and maybe even offer some guidance for truth-seeking patriots who are trying to figure out how higher education should address the crisis in citizenship. Okay. So first, citizenship. What do we mean when we talk about a crisis of citizenship? I think people who are worried about a crisis in citizenship have basically three things in mind. One, civic knowledge. Two, polarization. And also concern about civic action. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about each of those. Civic knowledge. Um, you guys have probably seen some of the results on the ways we've assessed civic knowledge. They're not good. <laughs> last, last year in May, we had the latest results from the NAEP, the National um, Assessment of Educational Progress, I think, but the NAEP anyway, which showed that um, among eighth graders in America, there's never been a worse understanding of American history. Something like 21% of eighth graders are proficient in American history. Something like 14% are um, proficient in civics, right? So that's, that's really worrying. Um, you've probably seen uh, studies too that show that like a third of American adults can pass the citizenship test that immigrants take when they're naturalizing into the country, right? So that's concerning. And people who look to that kind of stuff as an indicator in the crisis in citizenship say that citizenship is essentially about knowledge, right? You have to know certain basic facts if you're gonna participate well in a democracy like ours, right? So that's one way of thinking about it. Another way is polarization, right? And not just polarization in you know, the electorate or in Congress or anything like that, but polarization in terms of just how we live our daily lives, right? It seems like we have a bit of a crisis there. Um, so, uh, you know, people are increasingly choosing where they live based on party ID of the place they're moving to. Um, who we marry? 21%, um, I found a study that shows <laughs> of uh, marriages now are across party lines, which is the lowest it's been since they've been tracking these things. Up to two thirds of people on dating websites uh, use party ID as a filter. That's interesting. So that might be you know, an indicator of this problem we have with citizenship, that maybe what citizenship is about essentially is the ability to kind of see outside of our own opinions, relate to other people we disagree with, and you know, there's some kind of breakdown in our ability to do that. Third thing we could be talking about is civic action, right? our ability to actually engage in our community. So um, you guys, I'm sure I've read the you know, Robert Putnam's favorite, famous works on social capital showing that there's been a pretty steep decline from the 1950s to the late 90s when we started writing about that, the decline has continued according to this more recent work. Um, you've read a lot, I'm sure, about the loneliness epidemic, right? All these are indicators that we aren't getting involved in our communities in the same way we used to. So people who focus on that element of the crisis say, look, it's fine to know about stuff and to be able to talk to people from the opposite party. But if you're not actually getting out in the community and getting, engaging with people, you're not being a citizen in the most meaningful sense of the word, okay? So those are three different approaches, I think, to thinking about what's happening with citizenship in our own time. And I think it's interesting to start there because you can see they actually kind of converge on a theory of citizenship that I think in a rough and ready sense captures what we mean by that term. You can say it's the condition in which you have sufficient knowledge, bipartisan relationships and motivation to participate meaningfully in the life of your community. So again, rough and ready, I'll take that as citizenship. Let me talk a little bit about biography now. By biography, I mean a written account of a person's life from birth to death. And I owe that very elegant definition to a classicist by the name of Arnaldo Mobiliano, who wrote a great book on biography. Um, but a written account of a person's life from birth to death. Biography understood in that way as, is not very prominent today as a mode of inquiry in political science or in history. Um, my home discipline of political science, I can speak with some confidence about. In history, um, I've spoken to many historians who tell me that's true. <laughs> but even if you, if you don't believe it, if you look at like the... Um, the book awards that they give out in history, like the Bancroft Prize, for instance, is a very famous one. Um, like in the last 30, there may be two or three biographies that have won that award. Um, and if you think about also, this is another good way to get at, the, um, 
the many really fantastic biographies that have been published over the last two or three decades, like really first rate works, have been written a surprising amount of them by people who have no connection to academia, no like professor positions, right? So if you take like Robert Caro, for instance, who my money is the best of the bunch, right? It has more to teach us about politics and about American history than just about anyone teaching in, in those departments in academia. You know, he's done all of his writing outside of the academy. Um, the same goes for really wonderful biographers like Edmund Morris, um, Walter Isaacson, Mon Chernow, David McCullough, right? All of these guys might have an affiliation or two, but they're not primarily academic historians. So that's really interesting, right? Um, now, part of the reason they're working outside of the academy must be because they can right? Biographies are really popular. There's a market for them. You can earn a living as a biographer outside the academy. And that might even have something to do with why a biography isn't more popular in the academy, right? Or more prominent. Maybe it's a kind of ivory tower snobbishness, right? That whatever the, everyone in the masses are reading, that's not for us professors. Um, but I think there's a deeper reason uh, that I want to explore a little with you for why um, biography isn't more prominent in the academy. And that's a very simple observation about biography, which is that it focuses on one case, right? One person. The most authoritative social science methods we have um, in political science need large sample sizes, right? To speak confidently about what's going on in the world. In history, right? We, we have a kind of, um, uh, we favor accounts that look at large swaths of time and look at causes that move a whole lot of individuals at the same time. And from the perspective of both of those kind of methods, biography looks really narrow, right? You're focused just on one case, right? Not all the, all the stuff that actually moves history. Um, that critique of biography actually has a, a long pedigree, right? It's not just the contemporary social sciences. Uh, you may have come across this, this passage in Aristotle's Poetics, where he says that poetry is more philosophical than history, because history only deals with particular cases and tell you, it tells you what happened in those cases, whereas poetry tells you what could have happened and therefore has something to do with the general or the universal, right? So the core idea, I think, behind this critique is that the truth lies in the universal or the general but biography deals only with the particular. There's another part of that critique too. Insofar as biography can say something about the general causes that move history, it tends to kind of slant towards a particular theory of history that isn't very popular these days called great man theory. <laughs> the idea that, that individuals, right? And it's just a few individuals might be responsible for moving the big, you know, big things in history, not, like more general causes, okay? So the biography might kind of lend itself to that theory. So I want to put a point on what we might call the academic critique of biography. It's either uselessly narrow, pursuing the truth about just one case, or dangerously and wrongly inegalitarian, suggesting that one or a few individuals shape history. Its popularity isn't a big surprise, you might say, fleshing out this critique because it appeals to prejudices we all have, prejudices that uh, psychologists have taught us to call the anthropomorphic and narrative fallacies. <laughs> the, idea, the idea that um, you know, that history writ large works more or less like the world we see with our own eyes around us, right? So we, we see around us, you know, people are trying to do something, some people succeed, some people fail. We think history must be like that too, right? Some people try to do things. But in the same way that when it comes to like physics, we shouldn't think that the way we see things working with our own eyes reflects the truth of things as you know, quantum mechanics and relativity teaches us. So with history, just because we see things working one way with our own eyes doesn't mean that it's the truth of things. And in fact, the truth of things is revealed through these broader kind of calls that don't focus so much on uh, just one person. When you're doing biography then, again, this is the critique. You're essentially doing myth-making. Biography lends itself all too easily to myth-making. By the nature of the genre, it is constrained from getting at the truth of things. So if you're a student or a teacher and your fundamental commitment is to truth, biography should play a pretty minor role in your pursuit of the truth. If you're a citizen and you think that in order to act responsibly, you should do it in light of what's true about the world, you do a lot better to read history and, and uh, you know, political science that's produced by the academy, not biography, because right? that's going to lead you astray. As I've already suggested, I disagree with that critique, but I think it's worth taking seriously. To whom could we look for an adequate response? We need someone trained in philosophy, sensitive to Aristotle and other philosophers' points that the general is where the truth lies. We need someone trained in philosophy who nevertheless devoted himself to studying particular cases. We need someone who cared about citizenship, who thought deeply about how to use literature and other products of contemplative life 
to support, not detract from political life. Ideally, we'd find someone who not only thought about biography, but was himself a biographer, maybe even a pioneer in the genre, maybe even someone so accomplished in the field as to be known as the prince of biographers. Fortunately, we have just such a person in my man, Plutarch. Who was Plutarch? You know about Plutarch. You know a little bit about him uh, by his reputation. Because from the Renaissance to about a century ago, every educated man and woman in the West read Plutarch. Right? He was really popular, even more popular than David McCullough. You can imagine. <laughs> And it wasn't just that everyone read it. The most insightful, informed, astute people read Plutarch, like Machiavelli. Machiavelli called Plutarch a very grave author, which I think he meant as praise. Montaigne called Plutarch a perfect and excellent judge of human actions and said, above all others, Plutarch is the man for me. Shakespeare wrote three excellent pieces of secondary literature on Plutarch. <laughs> Coriolanus, the Julius Caesar, and the name of and, uh, and Plutarch informed a lot of his other work, too, including Timon of Athens, Henry V, and a lot of other plays. Rousseau attributed his Republican spirit and love of liberty to a lifelong meditation on Plutarch's works. Alexander Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, uh, read Plutarch while he was serving as General Washington's aide de camp. We know this because we have his notebooks where he took notes on the lives of the founders as he was serving as aide de camp to Washington out in his military tent. It's amazing. To the great regret of every Plutarch scholar, this scene did not make it into the musical. <laughs> it that was that It didn't happen. Uh, but anyway, so Hamilton liked Plutarch. Plutarch, of course, gave pseudonyms to the Federalist Papers and a lot of anti-Federalist papers, too. Um, his popularity continued in the 19th century. Emerson called the lives a Bible for heroes. And Nietzsche wrote this in the Uses and Disadvantages of History for Life. I'm put, Satiate your soul with Plutarch, and when you believe in his heroes, dare at the same time to believe in yourself. With a hundred such men raised in this unmodern way, that is to say, become mature and accustomed to the heroic, the whole noisy sham culture of our age could now be silenced forever. Okay. So it was partly thanks to praise like that that Plutarch fell out of favor. <laughs> the United States and Europe democratized in the 19th and 20th century. Although Plutarch still found some readers. Uh, it, it, Harry Truman said they don't, they just don't come any better than all Plutarch, right? So people still know. Um, so a lot of important people have read Plutarch. If you knew about Plutarch only through his reputation, I think you know basically three things about him. You'd know he was an ancient author. You'd know that he was uh, broadly pro-Republican, which is to say he favored republics, not monarchies or empires. And you know, you'd know that he um, wrote psychologically like sophisticated portraits of great statesmen, in part to inspire people to be great. Okay. I think you'd know those three things. Let me tell you a little bit more about each of those things. Number one, Plutarch was an ancient author. This is true. He was ancient and he was an author. So ancient. Um, he was born in 45 CE um, in um, the tiny polis of Chaeronea in central Greece. Um, he studied at the academy under a philosopher we don't know a ton about named Ammonius, but he seems broadly to have been, been trained in like Platonic philosophy in the academy. Um, he saw, saw a lot of Romans coming through Greece. We know he was there in person at the Pythian Games in the late 60s when Nero came through on one of his tours and competed in the Pythian Games and won all the events he entered. It's pretty remarkable. It's hard to be a member. Uh, but Plutarch was there. He saw that, he saw that uh, firsthand. Um, he also was involved in, in the greater Roman world the older he got. So we know he went to Rome at least once as an ambassador uh, from Greek cities. Uh, we know he lectured in Rome. We know he had a lot of connections among the Roman ruling elites of the time. Um, one of them got him citizenship. So he was a Roman citizen during his life. Um, and it, you know, very well connected in the Roman Empire. Also traveled a lot. He went to Egypt. He went to Asia Minor. So kind of traveled all around. You know, this broad swath the Roman Empire control. Remarkably, though, he lived most of his life in Cairne, in this tiny polis where he was born. Uh, from the 90s to 120, when he dies, he's in Cairne, um, writing the great works that we're going to be talking about in just a second. Also serving in a lot of local offices. Uh, so he was archon of Cairne, kind of like the mayor. He was um, a priest at Delphi, 10 or 15 miles away from Karenaia, a member of the Amphictyonic Council. So I had a lot of like local and regional political offices that he held. Um, and then, as I mentioned, died in 120. Okay, so ancient, definitely an, an ancient author. An author, he wrote a lot of stuff. He, he wrote, um, we have uh, two big groups of his works. One, The Parallel Lives, we're gonna be talking a lot about. 46 short biographies arranged in pairs. Okay, a lot more to be said about that in a second. The other part of his work, the Moralia, 
Okay, the morality is ballpark 70 uh, treatises, speeches, dialogues, basically everything that's not a parallel lives. Um, editors put into this big category called the Moralia. The Moralia is not a title that Plutarch chose for those works, right? That, that's something that the subsequent editors did. He chose the title Parallel Lives, which is important. Um, we also know, uh, according to a catalog that was written about a century after uh, Plutarch died, that there's probably about 100 or so works that he wrote that didn't come down to us, we think, right? So a very prolific author. Definitely ancient, definitely an author. Um, Pro-Republic, that's a little more complicated, right? Uh, Pro-Republic. Was he in favor of the Republic? Every comment that we have from Plutarch um, about contemporary politics suggests that he was basically okay with the Roman Empire. I mean, he had preferences for how it was run, but you know, there were people advocating an overthrow of the empire and a return to the Republic when Plutarch was alive. He was not among those people, okay? However, there's a reason that element of his reputation is there. It calls our attention to something really interesting about the parallel lives, which is he focuses on a particular sort of statesman, a particular chronological period, let's say. The last of his Greeks is Philippomen. He's a general in the Achaean League who dies in 183. So right as the Romans are kind of taking over Greece, right? That's the last chrono chronologically last of his Greeks. Last of his Romans, Mark Antony, who dies in 30 BC. You guys know about him from the secondary literature, if you haven't uh, read Plutarch. Um, so he seems to want us, his reader, right, in Parallel Lives, to think about the statesmen who lived in the free Greek cities and in the Republic, not the empire. Contemporaries of his wrote lives of a great statesman in the empire, right? Tacitus is almost an exact contemporary of Plutarch, writes a great life of Agricola. Um, he, you know, plenty of people you could write about if you wanted to. He chooses not to do that, right, with his parallel lives. He focuses on characters from the free Greek cities and the republics. I think that has partly to do with his reputation. Last thing, um, he writes these psychologically astute biographies of great statesmen. This calls our attention to something else that's really interesting about the parallel lives. They're all about statesmen, right? Plutarch admired philosophers. Um, as I mentioned, he was trained in the academy. He and his buddies would celebrate birthday parties for Plato and Socrates every year, right? They'd actually have parties for him. So he admired lots of philosophers. He also admired lots of poets. No philosopher or poet headlines a parallel life. Only statesmen. And so that's interesting, right? It calls our attention to another interesting element of the work. All right, so let me tally up what we know so far, just starting from Plutarch's reputation. Plutarch was a Greek under the Roman Empire who traveled widely in the empire and held Roman citizenship. And yet, he seems to have preferred his small polis of Chaeronea to the big cities of the day. He was a student of Platonic philosophy who wrote a number of abstruse philosophical works. And yet, his major work is concerned exclusively with statesmen and cast the philosophers in supporting roles. He was a seemingly loyal subject of the empire. And yet, his major work focuses on Greeks who live in autonomous cities and Romans living in the Republic. So each of those facts, those tensions, calls for explanation. There are two ways you might be tempted to explain them, which I will mention because I want to warn you away from them. <laughs> One, you can see Plutarch as a covert revolutionary, right? You may have heard that the Greeks always win in these pairs. I don't think that's true, but that's something you hear, right? It might be the case that the Plutarch is trying to show you that the Greeks are actually better than the Romans. Um, and he's kind of using the philosophy of Greek ethics and moral, uh, moral ethics, you know, in order to evaluate everyone, to subtly shift the discourse in pro-Greek favor and come the revolution, you know, where the ground will have been prepared by this post-colonial philosophy and so on, right? And that's one reading, covert revolutionary. Read number two, esoteric philosopher. Maybe what we see from the lives, all this tumult and chaos of these republics falling apart, is that politics isn't really where it's at. We should really, if you know, we're ambitious and we care about, you know, we should really go to philosophy and go hang out in Carinae with Plutarch and contemplate maybe the soul, you know, write abstract dialogues and so on, which we have a few from his, his, uh, his hand, right? And, uh, and all the other stuff we can call exoteric, right? So it might be an esoteric philosophy. I don't like those readings. The reason I don't like those readings is they put Plutarch very quickly into categories that are very familiar to us, right? We can say, so just like those other guys, those other covert revolutions, those other, you know, esoteric philosophers. So I think it's a lot more interesting to at least hold open the possibility that Plutarch is doing something new, maybe even unique to him, and just see you know, how it goes, read him that way, okay? So that's what I will propose we do together. I will also propose that we start from the most superficial thing that Plutarch gives us, this, uh, which is the title of the book, okay? The Parallel Lives. That's a really interesting title, The Parallel Lives. It's interesting because it focuses a lot of our attention on the literary form in which Plutarch wrote. We don't have a writing from Plato called Dialogues. 
We don't have a writing from Aristotle called lectures or treatises. They give us books like Republic, Laws, Politics, Ethics. Plutarch could have called his work Statesman. That would have been a perfectly fine title for it. He could have called it Illustrious Men of what, you know, whatever, some of the titles we use. Maybe he could have done like a contemporary historical monograph, you know, Greece and Rome, 753 to 30 or something like that. <laughs> he didn't do any of that. He called it Parallel Lives. Okay. Why did he call it Parallel Lives? Raises two questions. What is a life, according to Plutarch? What is life? And what does it mean to write lives as he understood them in parallel? So let's focus on those two questions. Um, I want to talk first about what Plutarch meant by a life. So probably the first thing to say here is that even though Plutarch is the prince of biographers, that's what Boswell called him, he did not invent the genre of biography. As best we can tell, biography was invented in the fourth century BCE, kind of arose out of the philosophical schools of the uh, Lyceum and the Academy, had some antecedents in the preceding century with the rhetoricians, but that's, you know, it's an old genre. Plutarch is very consciously working in a tradition when he's writing biographies. But working in a tradition doesn't mean that you're bound by the tradition, right? You can do some interesting things. And Plutarch definitely gives a distinct flavor to the lives that he writes. To get a sense of what the distinct flavor is, I want to read three passages to you uh, where Plutarch talks about what he's doing when he writes a life. Okay? The first one, I bet some of you encountered before, is the way he introduces the life of Alexander. Um, and I'm going to say, I'm going to read a few passages. I'm generally using Bernadette Perrin's translations that come to us in the low uh, classical library. But I've updated a few cases because he, he wrote that translation a long time ago. So I've modernized some of the English. And in a few cases, I've made it a little more accurate to the Greek too. Okay, but uh, credit where it's due, this is Bernadette Perrin mostly. All right, so I'll read the introduction to the Alexander. It is the life of Alexander the king and of Caesar who overthrew Pompey that I am writing in this book. Owing to the multitude of actions that have to be described here, I shall make no other preface than to appeal to my readers. Don't complain if I do not tell of all the famous actions of these men, nor speak extensively about each of them, but instead speak in summary about their great deeds. For it is not histories that I am writing, but lives. And in the most illustrious deeds, there's not always a manifestation of virtue or vice. A small thing, like a saying or a joke, often makes a greater revelation of character than battles where thousands fall or the greatest armaments or sieges of cities. Accordingly, just as painters get the likenesses in their portraits from the face and the expressions of the eyes, wherein the character shows itself, but make very little account of the other parts of the body, so I must be permitted to devote myself rather to the signs of the soul in men, and by means of these to portray the life of each, leaving to others the description of the great contest. So the point of writing lives, Plutarch says, is to depict the virtues and vices of a person's character by selecting what he calls signs of the soul from out of all that person's actions. Sometimes signs of the soul are sayings and jokes. They're not necessarily the big flashy actions like battles and sieges. Plutarch gets that point across by comparing the biographer to the portrait painter. Okay? And you can see some of the similarities, right? They're both, they, they kind of the purpose of what they're doing is the same. They both want to get after the character of their subject. And their method is kind of the same too, right? They're going to emphasize the parts that reveal character, de-emphasize the parts that don't. Right, so you get a lot more attention to the eyes than the forearms, right, if you're a portrait painter. So that analogy also calls our attention to some differences, I think, between the portrait painter and the biographer. Um, the portrait painter can pretty reliably know that he or she is going to have to paint the eyes, right? The eyes are a pretty good window to the soul. That's reliable. The biographer, on the other hand, has an infinite variety of small actions to choose from. The problem of selection, of putting together a life that reveals a character, is a lot more pronounced for the biographer than it is for the portrait painter. So that's one thing. The second thing is the portrait painter has to think a lot about audience, right? The portrait painter has a client. You might be obliged to depict, you know, lady so-and-so's pet spaniel or something. If she wants it in there, right? you got to put it in there. Um, and you, you better make the person look a little nicer than they look in real life too, right? That would be a very nice thing for you to do as a portrait painter. Um, Plutarch faces a different kind of problem, right? He's centuries removed from Alexander, about a century removed from Caesar. So he doesn't have a client in that sense, but what he does have are readers who come to the life with certain expectations. So he has to say at the beginning, look, Alexander Caesar, you picked up that the book with those guys on the title, you expect certain things, don't you? You expect big battles, right? You expect to hear the, you know, the greatest hits. Right? You go to a Beatles cover band and we play all B-sides, you were very upset, right? They have to play Hey Jude sooner or later, that's, that's part of the deal, right? Um, so that's what Plutarch's readers are like in his understanding of them. 
So he's writing consciously for fans or for partisans, right? People who have certain expectations. And he has to do a bit of education for the reader then. Look, this work is not that, right? It's, it's not histories, it's lives, like more behind the music, let's say, than, uh, than like the cover of it, right? So he, but, but you see what he thinks about his readers there. So histories, Plutarch says, are drawn to events that are great owing to size and number. They're, uh, you know, the scenes where thousands fall, that sort of thing. They're like our own social scientists and historians and their confidence that huge sample sizes and attention to impersonal forces reveals the truth of things. Plutarch contrasts his approach to this one. He says, if your interest is character in the soul, you can't be guided by greatness understood as quantity or size. Small things like sayings and jokes, right, can reveal stuff just like battles can. So in the introduction to the Alexander, Plutarch tells us how the lives help us to understand the people they depict. He's gonna teach his readers something about the soul of these people, right? They, the reader gets a kind of knowledge. Plutarch thought the reader got a lot more than knowledge from these works. And to show you what else the reader might get, I'm gonna read you the second passage I wanna look at, which is from the introduction to the Pericles. This is gonna be fun because um, this is one of the most profound passages in all of Plutarch. It's also one of the most offensive to us um, so get ready. This is my trigger warning to all of you. <laughs> Plutarch starts the Pericles by attacking people who love puppies. <laughs> all right, so I'm probably about to lose some recruits from Plutarch Brigade, I really don't <laughs> But here it goes. So I'm reading from the uh, beginning of the Pericles. On seeing certain wealthy foreigners in Rome carrying puppies and young monkeys about in their bosoms and fondling them, Caesar asked if the women in their country did not bear children. Thus, in right princely fashion, rebuking those who squander on animals, that proneness to love and affection, which is ours by nature, and which is due only to our fellow men, not puppies. Since then, our souls are by nature possessed of great fondness for learning and fondness for seeing. It's surely reasonable to chide those who waste this fondness on objects unworthy of their eyes or ears, to the neglect of those which are noble and beneficial. So he goes on to make a distinction between senses, which kind of take everything that's flowing in at him, and what we can do with our mind, which is like intentionally focus it on things that are good or worth knowing, right? That might improve us. He says, such objects as by their very charm, this is what we should think about, call it onward to its own proper good. Now I'm continuing. Such objects are to be found in virtuous deeds. These implant in those who search them out a great and zealous eagerness, which leads to imitation. Virtuous action straight away so disposes a man that he no sooner admires the works of virtue than he strives to emulate those who wrought them. The noble, this Pocalum, creates a stir of activity towards itself and implants at once in the spectator an active impulse. It does not form his character by ideal representation alone, but through the investigation of its work, it furnishes him with a dominant purpose. For such reasons, I have decided to per persevere in my writing of lives. So, Plutarch's purpose in writing lives is not just to present an image of a man's soul, it's to use that image to shape the reader's soul. And he has a fascinating theory of what the soul is to explain how that process works. By nature, the soul is love in part, but it also has some freedom in directing its love towards puppies or babies, towards whatever happens to rush into the soul or towards objects that are intentionally chosen. And among the many objects the soul can contemplate and love, Plutarch says, are virtuous deeds. And these have a quality that sets them apart from every other object of contemplation. They inspire imitation. Those who inquire into them naturally acquire great and zealous eagerness to do virtuous deeds of their own. The noble, and Plutarch presents it as an active thing, the noble creates and furnishes the inquirer with an active impulse and a purpose. So I'm gonna hold in suspense for a second whether that statement is true and just focus on what it reveals about Plutarch's intent in writing the lives. His idea seems to be that a life both displays virtuous action and facilitates the reader's inquiry into it in such a way that the reader becomes resolved to do good deeds himself. Plutarch, the biographer then, is the intermediary between the noble and a reader with the capacity for virtuous actions. Now that passage occurs at the beginning of the per Pericles and Fabius. Plutarch tells us are joined for all sorts of reasons. Like they do similarly great things, have similar virtues, similar relationships to their people, a whole bunch of things. It also happens as, as we inquire into them that they both live at the peak of their city's development, right? The very peak. Plutarch did not live at the peak of his city's development, right? The Greek yeah. cities are controlled by Rome when he's writing. Um, 
when he gives advice, Plutarch, to contemporary Greek politicians, he says, don't get confused and think you're in Periclean Athens, right? You're not. Every ruler in the Greek cities has you know, someone who's ruling him over his head all the time. You got to remember that. Which raises the question, what then are we supposed to learn? We live in a situation that's different than, you know, Pericles and Fabius. They're, they're kind of political conditions. What do we take from these lives? And that's a question that Plutarch addresses in the last passage I want to look at with you, which is from the Timoleon. Um, I guess you may not have heard of Timoleon, <laughs> third century liberator of, uh, of Syracuse, um, not as famous as Alexander and Pericles. I think that relative lack of fame is actually a nice preface uh, for, for what Plutarch is going to address uh, right here. So it's the last passage I'll read Plutarch says, I began the writing of my lives for the sake of others, but I find that I am continuing the work and delighting in it now for my own sake also, using history as a mirror and trying to fashion and adorn my life in conformity with the virtues therein depicted. The result is like nothing else than daily living and associating together. When I receive and welcome each subject of my history and turn as my guest, so to speak, and observe carefully how large it was and what sort of person. And I select from his actions what is most important and most beautiful to know. And oh, what greater joy can this, than this, this can you have and more efficacious for the improvement of character. The study of history and the familiarity with it, which my writing produces, enables me, since I always cherish in my soul the records of the best and most admirable characters, to repel and put far from me whatever base, malicious, or ignoble suggestion my enforced associations may intrude upon me, calmly and dispassionately turning my thoughts away from them, to the noblest of my examples. So here Plutarch gives us a glimpse into what the lives mean for him personally. He tells us that he started on this project for other people. Okay? The other people he probably has in mind are Roman senators. He dedicates a few of the lives, and it seems like the work as a whole, to a particular guy named Socius Senecio. Okay, we know a little bit about him. We know he's a, a consul twice in the empire, uh, which is still a very important office. I mean, not quite as important as it was in the Republic, but a big deal all the same. He uh, held high command in the Dacian Wars. So, you know, he's, he's uh, also actually from the East. That's an interesting thing. So as best we can tell, he's from Phrygia, um, out in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. So he's someone, you know, he's a native Greek speaker, um, a, kind of an elite where he grew up, who's incorporated into the Roman Empire and stands then for these interesting kind of intercultural issues, you know, the Roman Empire raises by kind of co-opting, you know, these uh, elite provincials, right? So th th that's an interesting thing. It also raises a broader point, which is relevant to the lives, that even under the empire, at the center of things in Rome, there's still some opportunity for great political action, right? Might not be the heyday of, of Greece and Rome, but there's still a guy like Socius Senecio, whose own political action presumably would benefit from contemplating the lives. Right. Plutarch, however, is in a very different sort of world right down in Carinaea. He's not with a Senecio up in Rome. He writes these lives while living in the small town of Carinaea. And remember, he holds a number of local offices there too. It's a very different situation than uh, Senecio. So what does writing lives do for a small town mayor and local dignitary like Plutarch? It offers a kind of escapism. That's one thing you can say, right? He can put away all his enforced associations and contemplate these great examples. And so maybe that in itself is kind of a joy. But Plutarch also seems to draw inspiration for his own small scale political action from these noble deeds. Now, it might strain our own credulity to think about Timoleon's liberation of Syracuse or Aemilius Paulus's victory in the Third Macedonian War as inspiring the mayor of a small polis in central Greece. But Plutarch gives every indication of being earnest on that point. Um, at one point in the Moralia, he talks about the kind of incongruity between the deeds he describes in the lives and his own political action on this very local level. I'll just read one a little bit from that. He says, I say to those who criticize me for standing and watching tiles being measured or concrete or stones being delivered, that I attend to these things not for myself, but for my native city. If one does it for the public and for the city's sake, it's not ignoble. On the contrary, his attention to duty and his zeal are all the greater when applied to little things. In other words, there's something inherently noble in political life from Plutarch's understanding, even under severe practical constraints. Contemplating noble examples, um, rather than, you know, the sort of stuff your political condition, your enforced association gives you, um, can improve not only your understanding of things, but your ability to do noble things in your own life. That's his idea. Okay, so to sum all this up, what's life? It's a portrait composed of actions, both small like jokes and big like battles, that reveals an individual soul. This portrait enables the reader's investigation into virtuous deeds, so as to facilitate the noble itself shaping the reader's actions not only in great politics, but in the political life of places like Plutarch's own Carinaeus. 
That's life. What does it mean to write lives in parallel? It'd be much briefer on this. So I think we can get at this question, what it means to write lives in parallel by talking about a part of the parallel lives that I haven't mentioned so far, which is this increases. Okay, so um, we have 22 pairs of, of lives. One of them has two Ithagraki compared to two Greeks, right? So 46 lives overall, 22 pairs. 18 of those 22 end with a syncresis, which is a kind of conclusion or a, kind of an appendix um, where Plutarch will make the case for one person in the pair, like Pericles is better than Fabius, and then turn and make the case for the other person in the pair, Fabius better than Pericles, okay? Between you and me, these aren't very good. <laughs> um, <laughs> other scholars agreed too, but his lives are really fantastic. It's really, they're really great. Um, increases, I don't know. I mean, Plutarch makes all sorts of bad arguments. He puts weird spins on anecdotes that he told in the last. Occasionally, he'll introduce like malicious new material um, that wasn't even in the life, right, that he brings up in this increases. So it's really a puzzle what to make of these short texts. And they are short, right? Like in the modern library edition, typical life is like 50 pages, give or take. This increases is usually two or three pages. Okay, so it's a short piece, but a short little puzzle. What do we do with that? Now, I've resisted translating that term because I think the English you use for it actually prejudges uh, what you're going to make of these things. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you two options and then what I think is the right option. One way of translating them is comparison. Okay, that's the most standard, most neutral. It's a perfectly fine English word for the Greek words increases. A okay, right? Mm -hmm. um, it calls our attention to the way that like our investigation into these individuals might be improved by putting them into close contact with one another, right? Maybe we see them in a slightly mm -hmm. more sophisticated way. So it's basically in line with what Plutarch was doing in the lives proper. Okay, that's one option. Option two, you can translate the word synchresis as combination or blend. Again, perfectly fine translation for the Greek uh, synchresis. Another context that means that. This way of, of um, translating it, I think, calls our attention to this interesting element of lives, which is that you got a Greek and a Roman. Um, you know, and you might see them then the lives as a whole as part of the syncretic project, right? That the Roman Empire is always carrying on. We have these different civilizations, they're kind of brought to bear into one big happy, you know, community and, and so on. And so we learned that Greeks are every bit as good as the Romans, Romans every bit as good as the Greeks. You can use the same kind of vocabulary to evaluate both of them. There's some principles of leadership that are universal and so Blend combination. The translation I prefer, judgment. It's in creases, the creases. Let's focus on the creases. <laughs> the creases comes from the Greek word krenein, which means to judge or to choose. I like the translation judgment because it calls our attention to just how combative these things are, right? Plutarch makes the case for one aggressively and then turns and makes the case for the other similarly aggressively, right? Lots of low blows and unfair moves and all sorts of stuff. He casts his readers when he's doing this as people who have a vote to give, right? So he says in the, uh, in the comparison of Theseus and Romulus, for instance, that um, he's just described Romulus as fratricide, Theseus as care for his son. He says, look, you're going to have to decide who to vote for. And on this one, probably you'll vote for Romulus, right? So he puts you in the role of someone with a vote. In other increases, he talks about you, the reader, as if you have an award that you're going to give to one of these guys, okay? Um, so you have, you're, you're someone with a vote, someone with an award. You have to make a judgment. Now, Plutarch does not himself make a judgment. He never says who comes out on top in any given pair. He consciously leaves that decision to the reader. Who's the sort of person who regularly makes judgments about ambitious statesmen contending for his or her vote? What do we call the sort of person who can sometimes be inspired by the best of the contestants to get in the game him or herself? We call that person a citizen. So here's the conclusion I think we're led to by the literary form of the parallel lives. Plutarch's statement, statements of his intent in the, the context of Plutarch gives us. This is the conclusion. Plutarch wrote the lives to educate for citizenship at a time when, thanks to the empire's replacement of the Republic and the limited autonomy of the Greek cities, the nobility of the citizen's life was in danger of being forgotten. Plutarch's intention then was to create a literary Republic that pitted great statesmen against one another for the reader's investigation and judgment. The literary Republic offered a kind of training and acculturation to those who entered it, one that could satisfy the citizen's skills and inspire noble civic action, Plutarch hoped, during times that differed fundamentally from the glory days of Greece and Rome. Plutarch's project had promise, not only for his own time, but future ages as well, since a literary republic is not subject to decline and fall in the same way that actual republics are. It might help to sustain the citizens' virtues under political conditions that threaten them. How did that work out? How does the project work out? Pretty well, I think. I think pretty well. I think it was a success. 
I mean, certainly the case that he, Plutarch has found and inspired reader shaped souls in places and under political conditions he could hardly have anticipated. Monk cells in the Middle Ages, the Chateau de Montaigne, <laughs> the tent of George Washington's aide de camp, and Carbon Hall 301. <laughs> That's a remarkable achievement. All right, so I'm, I'm almost on a cross, but I don't want to end quite yet. Um, apart from the desire to read more Plutarch and join me and Rebecca Burgess in the Plutarch Brigade, what do we take away from this quick tour of the parallel lives? I started by suggesting that Plutarch could allow us, uh, could show us how the genre of biography can help address our own crisis in citizenship, which is really different than the one that Plutarch is. Now that we have Plutarch's example in view, let me conclude by saying a bit more about that idea. So biography isn't very popular in the academy today. Um, and at bottom, I think, it's owing to a belief that the forces that move history and politics are bigger than particular men. That way it may well be true in part. But it's also true that the capacity to understand and make judgments about the souls of men is central to political life. Citizens have to decide who to vote for, how to coordinate their activities with other people to achieve shared goals, how to inspire, how to persuade. Citizens have to read others' intentions in order to get things done. It's no accident that some of our greatest statesmen have also been great biographers, like Teddy Roosevelt, Churchill, Kissinger. Um, they all have testified to the similarity between biographical thinking and civic action. There's also the important matter of inspiration. Plutarch claims that the noble creates an overriding purpose simply by the display of virtuous deeds. That may strike you as excessive, but it seems undeniable to me that one of the surest ways to inspire young men and women is to present models for them to emulate. Plutarch wasn't a hero worshiper. His portraits are, are very much like warts and all pictures of the people involved, despite his reputation. Um, is that literally warts and all pictures? The life of Fabius uh, tells us right up front that Fabius's nickname was Warty <laughs> because he had a wart like on his lip. Uh, he tells us that everyone called him Warty. Uh, Pericles had a very pointy head, Plutarch says, and that's why in the, the, the uh, bust of him, you know, he has that helmet. Have you ever seen it? <laughs> the, 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 pork, the sculptor did that because he wanted to cover this really like obscenely pointy head that, that, uh, that Pericles had. So, anyway, so, so uh, Plutarch isn't just like, you know, praising these people. It's not that. Everyone has their own flaws and their own biases and so on. The genre of biography, I think, doesn't have to be hagiography for it to present models for readers to emulate. One of Plutarch's leading virtues as an educator is that he knew how to use the power of admiration to inspire his readers. Bios, the Greek word for life and the root of the English word biography, can mean what happens between the birth and death of a particular individual, but it also has a broader meaning, way of life. In the highest manifestations of biography, as in Plutarch, the particular and the general allied to present us a way of life through particular instances of a type. That's what Plutarch does for the life of the citizen. And I think that's an achievement that can be both admired and emulated by patriotic truth seekers today. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. That was great. We have a custom here of allowing students to ask the first questions. I will let you uh, visually determine who is a student. <laughs> I might want to do a little application process and okay. you know, have people explain what they think. Charles, I know you're a student. Go ahead. Um, so, I wanted to, so um, the question I have is that because, so you did, so I know that uh, you're encouraging us to all become uh, Plutarchians in a sense, mm -hmm. but uh, let's say hypothetically the sort of Due to the length of time in between the modern day and the time of Plutarch, uh, people might not find him to be as potentially relatable, or the people that he talks about potentially as relatable uh, as they would like in order to pay attention to the sort of message he wants to bring. Mm -hmm. um, who would you say, like, who are some of the people would you say whose biographies would sort of uh, do the same, have the same effects Plutarch biography yeah. in the sense that they promote this concept of a citizen involved, not just in being a good citizen, but being a good uh, member of local politics. Oh, that's a really a good question, Charles. Um, I thought you were heading somewhere else, but like, who's a contemporary Plutarch who teaches us like the, 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 yeah, the good statesmanship in general, but you're asking about local politics specifically, and that's a little harder. Um, 
I don't know. What's a great life with like a mayor or a city council person hmm. or something like that? Yeah. I would love to know. Maybe one of you can write one of those. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't. Yeah, I, mean, I wish I had something to recommend to you. I mean, there's lots of great books about states, you know, that, that are very inspiring. Um, and I'm not struck actually when I, when I talk to students, I mean, even for all the, uh, you know, biography not being super prominent in the academy, when you ask a group of young people like what really matters in what books, like you get a lot more biography than you'd expect. And I think that shows you actually the way that these lives, not only of states, right, but just of remarkable people, right, can really inspire, you know, almost despite some of our assumptions about how these things work, they kind of reach out and have that effect on the soul. Um, yeah, so I don't know what the contemporary version of local statesman is. Just read Plutarch. Why do you got to go somewhere else? Mm -hmm. Figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. I, I wish I had a better answer for it. Yeah. Yes. Hi, so my name is Jansen. I'm a senior at the University, and you present uh, Plutarch today as having kind of two aspects of him as a street speaker, and, but more importantly, a biographer. Um, I wonder if there's kind of a um, a tension there. For example, the Plato talks about the noble lie, and I wonder where does this play in with Plutarch as he constructs the biography? Is a noble lie something that you think is essential for a biography, which perhaps creates like a false reality that can never actually happen? Again, where would he stand? I think that's a great question, Justin. So the question is, is there some element of noble lie in Plutarch? You know that where we see the values of a biographer coming into tension with the values of a truth seeker. I think it's a really wonderful question. I'll say two things. Um, one, Plutarch is not indifferent to the truth. So in the introduction to the Theseus and Romulus, for instance, he says, we've gotten back so far as like Kyrgyz and Numa, we're gonna push it even further. We're going into you know, straight old mythical territory. And we're gonna take these myths and see if we can make them into histories. Right, so he cares, he cares a lot about like getting to the truth as much as he can. Um, if any of you have spent time with lives, I know everyone rushed home later tonight to do that, but you'll notice when you do um, that he occasionally will give you a whole bunch of different versions of a particular event. Um, and it seems to be partly a concern for truth that he wants to put them in front of you so that you, you, know, you can work it out what you think is true. That said, truth is not his only concern in these lives. There are lots of cases where Plutarch will tell you a story like for instance, in the life of Solon, he tells about this scene where Solon talks to Croesus. Um, you know, and Croesus is a big wealthy guy. He shows Solon as, as he talks, says, "Look, I'm going to tell you this story. I don't think this actually happened. Right? I don't think this happened, but it's such a good story." <laughs> and and what he said, it's not just that; it's so revealing of the character of Solon that I'm going to put it in here anyway. Right? So that's a nice case where you see these two values, right? Kind of truth on the one hand, evaluation, presentation, character on the other. And we see Plutarch choosing presentation of character. So maybe he's a buyer for a truth seeker. On the third hand, um, he's telling you that he's doing that. Right? So my read on him is that in general, he wants to present noble, admirable images for you. He doesn't do Hegelian. He's not pretending these guys are saints or anything like that. Right? He's good. It really works well. I mean, even the best, and Cato the Younger, for instance, a lot of people think he's the best, screws up. Plutarch points out that he screws up at different points in his life. You know. So they're not supposed to be heroes, but he does want to kind of, almost if you're writing like a eulogy or a letter of recommendation or something, you kind of leave out some of the bad stuff, right? That's kind of how he, how he approaches that thing. So I think at the end of that, I'm thinking through this with you. Um, you know, I think there is a little bit of tension there, but he does it, let's say, to, for the sake of getting at a deeper truth, which is about the truth of character at the expense of some truth of like historical facts sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, when you're talking about uh, the kind of ideal person to walk us through a biography, and you're describing them as to be a philosopher, they need to be this type of person before getting to Plutarch. Um, I was wondering what type of person or what characteristics would it take um, to get a really good biographer for someone today who's very um, controversial? Like, yeah. who would the ideal person be to write the biography of someone like Trump? What type of characteristics would they need to do that in a Plutarchian way? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, you have to love truth, right? I mean, a, a truth of character, I think, but also the kind of truth. I mean, it, Plutarch is writing about a lot of controversial figures, right? So, like at the time he's writing, if you play praise Cato the Younger in the wrong way, right, you can be, you know, executed, right, for that. Um, he says in one of the pieces in the Moralia called Political Precepts, this is one where a young Greek guy says, look, I'm getting into politics. You know, give me some advice. Plutarch, you seem to know a lot of stuff. And he writes back to him. He's like, okay, I'll give you some advice. Um, 
And he says to him, like, you know, you want to really think seriously about your position vis-a-vis -vis the Romans, right? I mentioned that before. But one of the ways he catches that out is he says, you can't go around in the assembly talking about this great battle where, like Marathon, you know, where the Greeks defeated these foreign barbarians, right? If you do that in the wrong way, everyone's going to get a big head and they're going to do stupid stuff, right? So you can't do that, right? You got to be very careful with what you say. What's weird is that all those battles show up in the, in the lives, you know what I mean? Uh, even though he's focused on character, right? He talks about Marathon, he talks about a bunch of them. So somehow Plutarch seems to think that writing biography in the right spirit, couching them the right way, like demonstrating to the reader that you're trusted and you can, and so on, right? You're not like a rap or you know, or anything like that. That's the right way to kind of build trust to be able to teach someone. And it, when you do that, you can write about stuff that in another context would be pretty controversial and might lead people to do the wrong thing. Atticus, and then, yeah. In the absence of great biographers like Plutarch, could fiction do something similar? Yeah. Like, um, there's a book Imperium by Robert Harris that I really like about Cicero. Yes, I think so. I mean, it's a good question. How is fiction different? My sense is that for most readers of biography, the fact that it really happened matters to them. Um, because there's a, there's a way in which, like, even in really good fiction, I think the reader relates to it as fiction. If you get really absorbed in it, you know what I mean? Which isn't to say it's not worthwhile, like it clearly it is, it can shake character, all that, I must say that. But I'm saying like, I think the reason that particularly ambitious young people tend to really resonate with biography is they have a sense that like it can be done because this account shows me it can be done, right? I wouldn't necessarily think there could be a guy like Elon Musk or Frederick Douglass, you know what I mean? Like these really extraordinary people, but because the biography shows me, right, it says this really happened, then it has this particular kind of shaping effect, you know, that Plutarch is trying to describe. Um, so I think that's part of it. Um, I would also say, though, that I, I'm not committed to the claim that there are no great biographies being written today. In fact, you know, I think there are some fantastic biographies. They're not exactly in Plutarch's style, so they have some room for improvement. But, um, you know, so, so, some really great works. And I, I you know, I, I think they have the capacity to act in a way that Plutarch helps us to appreciate, actually. Yeah, yes, sir. Um, hi, my name's Natalie. Um, so as we know, most of the aspects of academia are pretty inaccessible. That's why we call it like the ivory tower. Um, if the main argument for moving biography into academia is civic education, which is important for every member of a democracy, how can we prevent these biographies from becoming inaccessible and therefore not supporting civic education? <laughs> <laughs> That's such a good question. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's a good question. It's a really good question. Another good question you might spend that in a little more aggressive and of an attack on my argument, which I think is in line with your sentence on, is that look, if everyone's reading biographies, what's your problem? You know what I mean? Like, like you know, these, these things are on the bestseller list all the time. In fact, I found a nice quantitative study that looked at um, the uh, bestsellers on the nonfiction New York Times list between 2008 and 2016. They said on the nonfiction list, what's the most popular genre, right? And it's biography slash autobiography slash memoir. Um, like a third of the books are in that category, far and away more than any other uh, category of nonfiction, right? So what we can do is like, you know, what's the problem then, buddy? You know, everyone's reading these stuff. And you know, you want to bring it to the academy and like you're making this academic, like high fluid stuff no one's gonna read, like that's not good. I think there's probably a good way to think about the relationship of what happens in the academy and what's kind of happening at large in the land, where they're not exactly the same thing, but they kind of complement one another. So I think, for instance, that the writing of, of history, you know, by non-academics is actually improved by there being academic historiography and vice versa. Um, similarly with music, you know, I think there's a way that music can very, and fiction too, for that matter, I, I think it's asked about that, you know, in certain situations, like learning how to really deeply dive into a novel and appreciate literature when it's done right, you know what I mean, in the academy, can just enrich your appreciation of fiction for the rest of your life and give you something good to do, you know, to share with other people and so on. So it's that kind of relationship that I think in my ideal world would exist between academic biography and the popular biographies. But there was just a little more uh, respect for this genre in the academy and that had kind of positive spillover effects. But I do not want there to be abstruse, you know, academic biographies full stop because, uh, you know, Robert Caro should still be writing these books. No, 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 no. <laughs> yes, Christina. My name is Christina. And I know you didn't um, mention this work like here just now, but I wanted to talk about um, his essay, whether an old man should engage in politics. I found it really interesting that he does argue that older men should 
continue their political pursuits because they took on that obligation. And so it's an honorable thing to keep on doing, if not to at least like serve as an example to the younger generation. And I mean, I like, I found it interesting, like that part about the younger generation, because it's kind of meta, it reflects like his ideals and his purpose with writing. But I mean, do you believe that this applies to our like U.S. politicians? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> or, or if, like our, if our leaders even like um, engage in a conscientious manner, enough manner to justify their continued representation? Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, so in case anyone hasn't read this recently, Tina has it. The uh, Plutarch has an essay in the Moralia called "Why Old Men Should Engage in Politics," and he's, he's an old man. He's writing to an old friend of his who's thinking about retirement. He says, "Don't retire. You got to stay in the game." And the reason is that there's a kind of nobility to political action, and if political action is noble, keep doing it right until you die. Right, you do the noble. Right? That's what you keep doing. This is argument, right? So you might think he has to step back and so on. Um, this is a very good essay for like, you know, uh, our current presidential candidates, you know, Senate leaders and so on to be aware of. Uh, it's a good argument. Um, so I think one thing you can say just as a kind of interesting like point about Plutarch is you might think that it's important to hold on to categories like some are political and others are non-political and like deservedly so. Plutarch is very reluctant to make those kinds of splits, right? He wants to say that old men should engage in politics because there's something good about political life. Right. Mm -hmm. Similarly, philosophers should talk to politicians because that's the best way for philosophers to have, do a kind of public service, shape the soul of the statesman, this sort of thing. So he really is, wants to kind of break down some of these you know, barriers. And that's an interesting aspect of his thought, right? That you can imagine other thinkers who are more concerned to divide those. Um, do I think he's right about that? In a certain sense, yes. I mean, he, he frames it as like you gain a certain kind of experience by participating, like a certain kind of knowledge that is only available to you by practice and by the prudence you acquire through practice. He contrasts an old man who might decide whether to stay in the game or not to some, some young upstart who's read a few works of political theory and thinks that, you know, he can kind of run the show better. And he says, look, we got to stay in the game. He's his friend, right? We don't want these kids to run the show. Um, you know, on the other hand, you know, there, there's definitely a case to be made for young too, that people can stay around to a point where it's denial, right? Maybe we aren't capable of, of notable action anymore. Um, so I think probably his position, a way to push him on it, I bet would be a little more balanced. He finds ways to admire young people in politics and lives for sure. Um, but I don't know, still kind of interesting the fact that often isn't defended, right? That old men inherently have something to contribute. Mm -hmm. So you've mentioned autobiographies kind of sort of around the edges of some of the questions you've answered, but I'm wondering what you think of the genre more directly. I think something like Parker Douglas' narrative is if we're talking about a biography giving us a window into someone's life and actions, nothing seems more personal and direct than an autobiography. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you think that that genre poses, you know, gives you unique benefits yeah. or if potential for someone to sort of sanitize their own actions poses yeah. risks. Yeah, I agree. That's right. That's a great way of framing the problem, right? <laughs> so. Yeah, on the one hand, we get all the benefits and more, right? Because, like, you know, Plutarch has to comb through all of these histories of Alexander and Caesar to look for little things that will reveal the character, right? If you're, um, you know, someone writing an autobiography, you presumably have more access to all the little events in your life that will reveal your own character, on the one hand. On the other hand, you're not exactly a, you know, disinterested judge of your own actions, right? And you have to worry about whether you're puffing yourself up uh, or not. Um, you know, I think in the case of the best autobiographies, uh, Frederick Douglass would certainly include, there's a kind of um, candidness and honesty in relating to yourself such that the reader has confidence that you're not just trying to puff yourself up or something. Right? Um, that's a very difficult thing to achieve because when you write about yourself, well, I mean, maybe speaking of someone, maybe you guys are very used to writing about yourself and putting pictures up and stuff like this. I, I find it very uncomfortable right, to, to write about something that's personal to me and put it up in front of a bunch of strangers right, to evaluate it. Um, so learning how to do that in the right way is a really key thing. But both of one thing though, no, one of the virtues of, of autobiography that I think biography has a really hard time with in general, particularly with this political man, is that as an autobiographer, you have access to your thoughts and feelings in a way that's a lot more difficult for a biographer to achieve. So I find autobiographies totally fascinating when they can establish this kind of relationship of trust with the reader and then say, look, this this public thing I did, here's what's kind of going on when I was doing that. Mm -hmm. or, 
or here's what I think my soul was doing when I acted in this way, right? So like Augustine, for instance, gives us those kind of accounts of all the different things that are going on in childhood. So autobiography seems to have particular kind of access and like a hold on us, I think because of that, that element of it. It's very difficult to think about. Yes. I was wondering if you think the value of like biographies in the style of Plutarch would apply as well to the modern day, like given our view that like, I, I feel like most people were very hyper-partisan age, but people don't really view political life as noble in the same way that maybe like a Roman or Greek would. Like, I don't think we admire like statesmen or generals in the same way. Mm -hmm. And we'll, so will it apply the same way in our kind of really cynical age, especially in academia and even more broadly, to be able to like kind of learn as like an informed citizen from like great men and women? Yeah. Um, I, I think it's all the more necessary because of everything you said. Right? Um, so we really need it precisely because we start from cynicism. Um, I think, you know, when Plutarch is writing, he occasionally, as I mentioned in the talk, will cast his readers as partisans. You know, you're seeing this heavyweight title match between Alexander and Caesar. You might be cheering for one side, right, for the Greek hero or the Roman hero. And he wants to write the lives of both of them in such a way that you can recognize that the other guy has some virtues too. Right? What a valuable thing that would be for us, right? Talk about generating this, you know, this, this concern about polarization as a, an indication of the crisis in citizenship. You know, the ability to actually see someone up close whose opinions you disagree with and see that they're, you know, a human being trying to do a good thing. They even have some virtues maybe that you can improve on, even if you disagree with them, that sort of thing. They come from a different civilization, a different race, whatever, right? That's a really powerful thing that literature correctly, you know, well-written can do. Um, and, you know, my money, like we could use a lot more of that, I think, today than we're actually doing. Yeah. Um, in the early parts of your speech, you talked about the evidence of communist, the kind of lack of community in the modern day. Other than you know, more engagement with biographies, or some other ways do you think we can kind of address that issue right now? Just just <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so it is a really good question. Um when Plutarch even Plutarch. Um you know, he's writing for people who aren't just reading biographies. You know what I mean? Like he's writing for people who are engaged in their own, uh, have the potential to engage in their own politics and this sort of thing. So I would never ever say just read biographies. Right? There's a lot of other stuff you should be doing. Um, and you know, this is, but the way you can kind of live with literature, and not, not just biography, but you know, philosophy and fiction too. Um, if you're, you know, if you have the the great blessing, right, to be well educated and to learn what it's like to interact with people and you kind of like push it yourself and so on. I say it's with you for the rest of your life. And it's an amazing, amazing, wonderful thing to have. Because whatever you're engaged in, you always have the ability to pick up some, you know, wise person who wrote a book about that stuff and use it to reflect and refine your own thinking, make sure you're doing the right thing, you know, uh, have conversations, build community with people around you, you know, through reading the book together. I think that's fantastic. So I think like one of the, the, the advantages of reading my art, but really anything, is having that kind of ability to interrogate your own action, whatever you're doing. You know, with this this kind of uh, companion you have, right? Um, but you have to be doing something. You're right. I mean, you could be a biographer. I don't know. <laughs> but even you biographers, you're doing stuff. You know what I mean? They have uh, families and communities and things. Yeah. Yes. Um, given Strauss's focus on people like Xenophon or Aristophanes or and otherwise um, people whom much of the academy ignored and the students as well. Why do you think uh, uh, Plutarch really has him, as far as I'm aware, besides yourself, uh, gotten the same treatment? I was just saying, we have another Plutarchist in the room. So we, we have numbers, right? We have two. It's a really good question. It's a really good question. Um, uh, yeah, what's the answer to that? It's a why. I mean, first of all, Strauss writes a little bit about Plutarch. Like, I, I kind of playfully alluded to this idea that the Greeks always beat the Romans. As far as I know, the originator of that comment is, is Strauss. Um, you know, he occasionally cites a story here and there and that sort of thing. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but I'll give you a guess because that's maybe better than the actual answer <laughs> or nothing, rather. Um, I think Plutarch is not an esoteric philosopher, right? I think he really means it when he says, that there's nobility in political action, that um, the you know people who like kill themselves rather than violate a principle are admirable, right? I think he really believes that stuff. And he thinks there's a kind of complementarity between the philosophical life and the political life. 
that um, is different than some of the impressions you can get from Strauss when he's writing about like a Xenophon or, or other people. Um, I don't know for sure. I really honestly have no idea whether that's the deep reason that Strauss didn't pay any attention to Plutarch, but it does seem to me that Plutarch's a different kind of author than a lot of the authors that Strauss does write about. Yes. But there's of course a big difference between comparing um, with the idea that there's nonetheless truth and outright relativism. Yes. So my question very simply is this. You mentioned, for instance, that uh, Plutarch uh, was steeped in Socrates, Plato, and so forth. For Socrates and Plato were themselves very different. If you're if you aren't familiar with this book, I just read it a couple of weeks ago, Paul Johnson's biography of Socrates. I have not read that. It is superb. Yeah. And it is probably the best biography of Socrates that he has done all the research. But one of the main points of the biography is to accentuate the huge difference between Socrates's mindset and that of Plato. Mm -hmm. So with that preface, what would you say is the ethics of Plutarch? Yeah. What does nobility mean for him? Yeah. Because it's not, well, this guy is very good in this, he's not very good in that. Take your pick, you're a citizen, go to the polls and model. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yes, yeah. uh, question asked. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you. I, what are his ethics uh, broadly understood? Where do they come what from? What is nobility? What is nobility? What's... Yeah. I think the, the best way to start from Plato and Aristotle is to say that he means moral virtue by nobility. He praises courage, praises moderation, you know, praises the, the list of, of moral virtues that we find in the ethics, for instance, in Aristotle. Um, he praises prudence, he praises deliberation, you know what I mean? They're, they're, all these virtues that we find discussed and analyzed in Plato and Aristotle show up in Plutarch as well. So I think in a rough and ready sense, that's what he means by nobility, is there those virtues, mm -hmm. virtues of character. Um, he, you know, he does discuss the lives of Socrates and Plato, interestingly. I, I don't know if Johnson draws on his work, um, but, you know, Socrates is an important character in the Alcibiades, um, you know, he talks about their, their relationship, um, presents it as, as a, you know, failing ultimately to shape Alcibiades, you know, ambitions, but not without any effect on his career too. Um, Plato, uh, he describes in great detail how he goes to Syracuse uh, with his student Dion. He praises Plato for doing that, says that's a nice model of how philosophers should engage in politics, <laughs> is by going to try to educate tyrants, yeah. Um, so, Interestingly, it's not only that he doesn't draw a very sharp divide between the philosophical or intellectual virtues and the moral virtues. He goes out of his way to present philosophy, even in the persons of Plato and Socrates, as something that is kind of tied together with political life in a way that there isn't a fundamental tension between them. So it depends on our reading, like of, of, you know, Plato and Xenophon, whether we find that to be in some way compatible with you know, what we learned from them or not. Um, you know, I don't think Plutarch understood himself to be doing something that was incompatible with Plato, right? I think that's what he took from him. Ben and then Tom, is that okay? Sorry. I'm trying that's to decide which of you is more students since I've been talking about the time. You mentioned Jean-Jacques Rousseau in your catalog of admirers of, of Plutarch, but <clears throat> Rousseau has a complicated relationship with his own reading of Plutarch, which I think illustrates a, a potential problem with the probiography thesis, which I am highly inclined to, to endorse. <laughs> but the, the problem is this. <clears throat> Rousseau says, my encounter with Plutarch alienated me from the world that I actually lived in, uh, in two aspects. One, I'm a Christian, and or I'm living in the Christian world, rather, and Plutarch is living in the pagan world. Two, I live in the modern bourgeois world, and he lived in the world of heroic uh, um, or semi-heroic, or at least dramatic, the um, uh, ancient politics. Yeah. So how, how do you think about the potentially alienating effect of, of dwelling on Plutarchan yeah. biography? 
yeah, it's a problem. Uh, that, that could be one of the impacts that reading Plutarch has on you. Right. Um, just to push back, though, a little bit against that and suggest that it's more the fault of Rousseau than Plutarch. Oh, right. Fair enough. <laughs> so Rousseau's living in a kind of modern bourgeois world and so on. Yeah. Um, many Plutarch scholars, uh, the, the, the most interesting of them I know is a guy named Matt Crawford, who I'm sure a few of you know has written really interesting works. But, um, but his thesis on his dissertation on Plutarch points out that there are some interesting similarities. Right? There's a lot, a lot more to say too, but like you know, between the kind of world that Plutarch is living in under the empire, let me stress, <laughs> under the empire, Plutarch does not live in Pericles' Athens, right? right? He lives in a world where he feels he really has to work hard to get you to be interested in public life yeah. because you are very tempted in his world to go live in your garden and contemplate to go just eat fancy foods, you know, to, to like make money or whatever, right? right? He wants to persuade you. The fact that he has to persuade you shows you that there's a little more in common between his world and the empire uh -huh. and our world. You know, they, obviously you can go too far with that, but there's a, they at least want, right? Some elements of their world. Yeah, on the, the Christianity point, that's a really interesting question. There's a, there's a long history actually of Christian readers of Plutarch kind of appropriating him mm -hmm. and finding him much more compatible than other pagan authors. One of the most fundamental reasons for that, and this comes from a scholar named Frank, who has written some really interesting stuff on Plutarch and Christianity. Um, one of the interesting reasons is that, like, even in that passage I referred to from the Pericles, where the noble is, like, reaching out and doing stuff, yeah. you know, like, the ultimate principles in Plutarch aren't just passive things that you contemplate. They actually are kind of, like, loving, active principles. So it's not like just the good is shining light and that's all, right? right. It was actually kind of, like, loving you back you know, when you love it. You know, is he influenced by Christianity? No, not at all, right? It's not that. Uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't have any notice of Christianity in his works. Gibbon makes a lot of this, actually, right? You know, Plutarch is one of the many elite pagans who couldn't care less about the Christians. You know, and that shows us, right? The, the kind of obscure status, right? I mean, during his lifetime, 45 to 120, you know what I mean? He could have noticed, but he didn't. Yeah. Um, but anyway, there's enough in his work that kind of like shows some kind of intimations of stuff that Christians can at least identify with that he hasn't been as rejected or as like vulnerable to having his books burned, you know, as other pagans occasionally were, you know. Tom, do we have questions? Oh yeah, Tom, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm not here to ask questions for myself. I'm here oh, to ask <laughs> Or as some people call it, a prophet. <laughs> so, um, so, but there are, we have friends yeah. in Zoom land. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, uh, Ken Masugi, our friend Ken Masugi. Yeah, Ken Masugi. Ask, uh, have you, this is a very tech question. Okay. Have you considered writing a bio sketch of Justice Clarence Thomas? Oh. If not, who among the, the current political class broadly construed would you profile? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, there's already a great like documentary about Clarence Thomas, right? Oh, okay. So, I mean, now that we have documentaries and movies, uh, well, and I'm right. Yeah, right. He wrote the autobiography. That's true. Yeah, it, it, very good autobiography. Um, yeah, I have not personally considered it. I'm, I, I don't really, you know, for someone who praises, I've done a little bit. I, 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 when I try to like understand an author where we know something about what their life was like in addition to their works, it just because of the way my mind works, I find it very useful to put the life and work into conversation with each other um, in a way that ideally doesn't reduce the author to the surroundings of the context but kind of uses that to like call our attention to what's really valuable and new usually like in, in the work. So like my work on Gibbon, for instance, is very much that spirit. So I've done a, a little bit of yes, biographical writing I mean, in that sense. Um, I haven't thought about it. Yeah, who in, in the current scene deserves a Plutarchian biography? What a great question. You know, it's interesting to me that Plutarch doesn't write, um, I don't know where I should be looking so I could look. <laughs> in the eyes. Yeah, yeah. more behind there. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, so, uh, it's interesting to me that Plutarch is born, you know, century and change after Antony, who's the chronologically latest in the lives, dies. Um, that gives him a kind of safety, you know, because although he's writing about some charged figures, at least none of them are alive or have like, you know, brothers and sisters who are going to get vengeance on him if they don't like something that he wrote. Um, he does have the capacity to write about people in the empire, as I mentioned, and chooses not to do that. Um, he, he has, I should, should have mentioned this, two lives of emperors that have come down to us, you know, but they seem to have been conceived as a totally separate project from the parallel lives. Um, so one way to punt on that question is just to say like, we don't know until a little time has passed, like who deserves a Plutarchian life. Um, there are, as I've mentioned many times, books I consider absolutely fantastic, you know, biographies about statesmen who have lived fairly recently. Um, some of whom Plutarch probably wouldn't have chosen. Like, I don't think he would have chosen Robert Moses to write a biography about. Um, he might not have chosen LBJ. 
Yeah, you know, there's an element. In fact, one of the things that makes those those Carol books so amazingly wonderful is that he highlights the way a soul type that Plutarch may have been familiar with. I mean, someone who's ambitious, who has a certain taste for power and so on, just expresses itself so differently under a different circumstance, right? Where there are these huge bureaucratic structures that you need to master, institutions you need to master in order to get power, and you know can adapt itself right to that setting and, and uh, you know manifest in a different way than anyone Plutarch. So that's really kind of fascinating. Yeah. But yeah. anyway, I would say like we should look to the contemporary biographers who are doing amazing stuff to see the lives that are really calling out and you know allowing us to both emulate and reject in certain respects as a model for how to think about that. Anything else? Yeah, we, um, lots more questions. Um, Shanesha Charles, who used to be our colleague here. Thank you for in, in introducing Plutarch to a modern audience. As you noted, Alexander Hamilton read Plutarch and considered his work most essential to his understanding of politics. How might Plutarch shape our reading of the Federalist? Yeah, oh, that's such a good question. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, so I, I often will assign Publicola alongside the Federalist papers, um, just so we have that front and center, right, when we're thinking about it. Um, I mean, I, I don't know that I have anything particularly profound or that I'm not borrowing from Douglas Adair to say about this, um, but I think you can at the very least say that choosing this particular, you know, pen name to write under calls attention to the, the, the grandeur, right? The glory that the, the founders kind of anticipated for themselves, that in the way that, you know, these, these, this uh, person founded Rome, right? So we are founding this new thing. Um, I think it also, and this is a dare's, another dare point, is that um, it calls attention to the way that these modern figures living in this bourgeois world that they live in and all that, right? Still identify with these glory, crazy ancient statesmen, you know, and see like uh, that kind of political action. Alexander Hamilton for sure does as um, you know, it kind of resonates with the way they think of their own life, I think. So thinking about the ancient analogs, I think is useful for that. And just one last point on that, which is maybe more my own than that, which is that I think it, come, it comes very naturally to a lot of people to draw these strong divisions among periods. Plutarch, by virtue of writing this work that spans you know, eight centuries, that, that like leaps over these civilizational boundaries and so on, seems in practice to have committed himself to a kind of universalism about certain fundamental things in the soul and that's, a, you know, I think a useful and provocative claim we can take from him. All sorts of stuff changes, right? He's very sensitive to the differences in regimes, all sorts of things. But he seems to think there is something universal about what human beings just are, you know, such that you can actually relate to an Alexander or Coca Cola as someone who informs you about yourself, you know, even when you're separated from him. Oh, yeah. yeah, just a yeah. note on the Coca Cola. Yeah. I mean, the, one reason why it's chosen is simply because these, these are founders who are not leaving. Yeah. You know, so there's staying around <laughs> as opposed to, yeah. you know, some other ancient founders who disappear after giving the laws. So That's a really good point. Yeah. Yes. The question about the judgments. Um, why, well, two questions. Why are some of them missing? Yeah. Is that intentional or, or were they just lost? And why are the ones that are there bad? Are they yeah. intentionally bad or meant to, to represent kind of the rough and tumble of Political judgment. So the latter is my my read on it is that they're just kind of rough and tumble, like we're getting kind of into the arena in those. Um, there might be something more to say about that. I don't know, but that's the best I can do at this point. Um, why are some of them missing? That's a great question. I've tried very hard to figure out what the common link is, you know, with those four uh, that we don't have. Um, I don't think there's a great reason that they're missing. And, uh, you know, I, in the absence of a theory that explains that, the, the winner is just like they got cut off of some medieval manuscript. <laughs> or lost to history. It is a fun assignment, though, if you're ever teaching uh, those, like the Alexander Caesar, as an example, to have students read them and then write the the judgment. I will insist on calling it as a comparison, you know, because it's a real challenge, especially to get the style of Plutarch right. There, you know what I mean? The, the, the dirty flows and you know all the stuff that he does. These increases. Mm -hmm. um, those are both good questions. Yeah. So um, you made the point that on the citizenship, in particular, that, that Plutarch's parallel lives with. The judgment he wants you to make a judgment about these characters, you know, or at least understand how you would make a judgment between various characters. Um, but what you didn't bring up is whether Plutarch wants you to make a judgment between Greek civilization and Roman yeah. civilization. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, and so does he want you to make a judgment between yeah. Greek and Roman civilization? He doesn't put it that way, right? He does tell the reader that the reader has to make a judgment between two figures. That he presents, um, but I, I don't know of anywhere where he says, the, you know, the end of the work. Or I mean, there's not really an end of the work, too. Like we don't know exactly how it was structured. We have some indications, but you know, it's not like he tells you like you're going to have to pick one of these. 
Um, it is very clear that he's choosing those categories, though, to to pick you know protagonists, right? So, um, like in Romulus thesis, you know, he says we have we have Romulus who's going to compete, who's going to fight with him. That's what he says. You know, who's going to fight? Um, does Plutarch himself, though, in the absence of asking his reader to do that, does he kind of suggest that as a project? I don't think so. At least not on how I read it, there. And I, you know, there might be more to add for it. He seems very concerned to kind of cross some of our expectations about who belongs in what category, I think. So it's fair to say, for instance, that there's more philosophy in the Greek lives than there is in the Roman lives, right? And if you think he admires philosophy, you know, that's his foremost virtue, you might say that makes the Greeks better. I don't think so. He can, he can describe, you know, Roman lives that are very much influenced by philosophy of Brutus, for instance, is. He can also describe um, Greeks under certain conditions or rather Romans, like he describes Numa as the more Hellenic lawgiver, um, you know, than Lycurgus, because of his, you know, the way he kind of taps into culture and, and philosophy and religion and all this. So I'm, my reading of it is that he really is concerned to use the same categories and point out the similarity in souls between the two civilizations. On the level of cities, he has, you know, he's sensitive to different institutions. He wants to describe the fall of the Republic in a way that doesn't track exactly with the fall of Athens or Sparta. So I think in that area, like evaluating political institutions, we can kind of like see if we can work out, you know, some judgment between the two. But I think on the level of individuals, it's very hard to work out. Yes, Gordon? Is, are the virtues of statesmanship? Go ahead. Go ahead, Gordon. Are the virtues of statesmanship the same as the virtues of citizenship? Or does he suggest tension? Yeah, yeah great question. Yeah. yeah, so I'm kind of taking it like statesmanship are the virtues writ large and citizenship is the virtues writ small, but that's a highly contentious claim. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, it, so I, I guess like, I don't know, it's unfair to ask you a question since you asked me a question, but like, how would you think about distinguishing them? How would one think about distinguishing them? I'll just ask the other in case you don't want to think. Like, you know, the out in, in the Alcibiades or, or the Pericles, like yeah. Alcibiades is a very complicated figure yeah. and he's in one sense, a great leader. On the other sense, on the other hand, you know, how many of those can you take? Yeah, uh, yeah. So that would, yeah. that would suggest that there are Aspects of leadership that are maybe uh, toxic in certain yeah. relations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was necessary. In others, or yeah, that's no, that's a good point. I mean, I think Plutarch is going to like import some like moral categories into his evaluation of statesmen. He doesn't consider it a neutral thing that Alcibiades betrays Athens. You know, that's that's a strike against him. Uh, like, well, he's just being a great statesman or a great leader or anything like that. So I think it is absolutely true, and I think you know, Plutarch is capable of recognizing it, that statesmanship, or rather leadership, like if we use a morally neutral term, I guess that's kind of morally neutral, you know, can be used for bad and for good, right? Um, he seems to have like noble exercises of political influence or noble exercises of leadership in mind, kind of writ large when he talks about statesmanship. And I think you would do the same thing with citizenship. That would be the question. What would yeah. citizenship look like? Yeah. I will say, just because this reminds me of something I haven't mentioned, you know, we've been talking about the relationship between like moral and philosophical virtues and whether, you know, Plutarch is kind of capable of thinking outside of morality in some ways. There are several places in the lives where he faults statesmen for being excessively moral. You know what I mean? For sticking by a principle when they really should have been, because it would have been much better for the, the, the city, you know, if they had been. Um, so just three cases that come to mind, Dion, you know, he is blamed at one point for being a little too moral. Um, he should have like executed someone who he kind of forgives, you know, even though it wasn't totally right to do it. Um, Cato the Younger should have been a lot more willing to make marriage alliances that were a little unseemly, but like really would have prevented Caesar from rising to power. And um, Phocion, who's another, you know, influenced by philosophy, like all those guys are influenced by philosophy. Um, Phocion, he says at one point, puts his own kind of selfish morality, in other words, like his, his principle. He, he, he's too moral because he should have been at a certain point and it would have been good for the city had he done that. So Plutarch is not going full Machiavelli and separating them and saying like, we need to learn the arts. Like definitely not doing that, but he's not totally bound by like moral categories when he's describing statesmanship at the same time. It's precisely because this obligation to do the city's good over what's like consistent with your moral code that comes up in certain situations. He wants to call our attention to. Yes, I just wanted to say, uh, you're gonna like this Professor Flanagan. I'm kind of reminded in that question of the argument about the differences between, as um, 
Socrates and Plato put it, the justice of the soul versus the justice of the city and sort of the differences in morals and purposes of both. I saw, I saw that, I, I instantly, I, I saw that in your question. I, <laughs> you drilled that into me. <laughs> you guys are clearly doing something right here. <laughs> getting flamed. <laughs> you now you need to give him that credit. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe I'll, I'll ask the last question. All right. um, <clears throat> You rightly point out how Plutarch, in, in various places, cautions audience members that the Romans are above them, and so don't go too far. Yeah. Yet the whole gist of, of the nobility that he portrays yeah. is to encourage us to go the farthest. Yeah. Is that is there a tension? I mean, obviously there's a tension yeah. there. How how does it get reconciled? Does does Plutarch in the end is there is there something about the project that is anti-Roman and yeah. and and or we should be our own Romes? I don't think so, Alba. It's a good point. I, I don't think Plutarch is pushing us to go the farthest. Right. There are situations where he admires people who kind of go to the mattresses and like kill themselves, you know, in certain situations. So that's true under certain cases. When he talks about his own political situation though, like for instance, in the political precepts, this work I've referenced a few times where he's given advice to a young Greek. He says, the Greek cities now have some freedom and perhaps more freedom wouldn't be better for them. Hmm. So we have some things now, we have a kind of harmony, we have a kind of peace. This allows certain you know, good forms of life to exist. We can focus our political action on kind of like healing divisions in the cities, you know, kind of tamping down on contentiousness. Um, certainly on building, you know, beautiful things like big civic buildings, like, you know, there's stuff you can do in politics. Perhaps more freedom wouldn't be better. For mm -hmm. I think one thing I feel confident saying, though, and this is about as far as I think I'd go in, in the direction of, like, you know, we want to hold out against Rome. Tacitus, Plutarch's, you know, contemporary, almost exact contemporary, gives you a picture of the empire where it doesn't seem like you can return to the Republic, I think. But at the same time, he wants to show you how disgustingly base and horrible all these senators who are just like kowtowing all the time to the emperors are. He seems to set his reader up for a vision of the empire in which the Senate and the kind of elites who aren't the emperor have a kind of dignity in how they carry themselves, right? The emperor does owe a certain kind of deference to the Senate. He's really against the situation that gets that wrong, even though he's not a revolutionary. Plutarch similarly, but with respect to the Greek cities, seems to think of it that way. You can have one empire where the cities, the kind of local level, um, is granted a kind of autonomy that is favorable towards the nobility of public life. You can have another kind of emperor where every you know, a centralized empire, let's say, where you know cities don't get to call any shots, there's no autonomy, whatever. Who talks in favor of the autonomous option versus the total non-autonomous option? But I don't think he thinks as a practical matter, that means you can, you know, you just can't revolt against Rome. It's not going to end well for the Greek cities. And he's at least open to the possibility that as a theoretical matter too, there might be something good about a universal political body that allows certain autonomy on the local level because it does preserve certain human goods and allows some form of the other kind of more active human goods to exist too. Well, thank you. I know there was a lot good in your talk. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you.